for joining us at our first Broadening Horizons um, in Preservation ca uh, Heritage Cafe lecture series. Uh, we used to hold these events in person, but uh, due to the success of our virtual programming last year, we decided to keep these events virtual. Uh, we have a number of lectures slated for the coming months, so uh, please check out our Facebook uh, or Instagram pages for more information on those. And tonight's lecture is presented by Michael Hauser, our uh, state architectural historian, and he will be taking us on a groovy tour of 1970s architecture. This lecture is brought to you by the City of Tacoma's Historic Preservation Office in conjunction with Historic Tacoma and the Tacoma Historical Society. I am Zoe Scuderi. I am the Historic Preservation Intern for the City of Tacoma. Uh, we are joined tonight um, by Stephen Treppers from the Historic uh, Tacoma's Board of Directors. And Stephen is also a Historic Preservation Consultant and has some experience um, evaluating and researching buildings from the 1970s. So he is going to be able to contribute at the end um, of this presentation with our discussion. And that brings me to the uh, Q&A side of things. There should be a Q&A function. Um, please ask questions. Uh, we will be taking those questions at the end um, and answering them and talking a little bit more about what we just learned. Uh, before we begin, I want to mention that on behalf of the Tacoma Historical Society, there are two new exhibits opening up in the coming weeks. Um, one exhibit is called Timbertown, and it looks at Tacoma's early history of wood products uh, and the wood products industry. Um, the exhibit focuses on the changes uh, of mechanization that was brought into forestry in the 1920s and the different related industries that developed in Tacoma as a result. A reminder that the Tacoma Historical Society is also now located at 406 Tacoma Ave South and Tacoma Historical Society would like to recognize the additional support received from Tacoma Creates for heritage education programs. Uh, before I introduce Michael Hauser, I'd like to uh, pass things over to Stephen Treffers uh, to introduce himself and then we'll get started. Great, thanks Zoe, and uh, very much excited to uh, be here and uh, listen to Michael's presentation. Uh, I, yes, I'm on the Board of Directors of Historic Tacoma, and I'm also an architectural historian uh, a consultant with a group called Rincon Consultants, and had a, a lot of experience, or, or more experience, I should say, recently with uh, researching and evaluating uh, properties from the 1970s as they start to meet that 50-year-old threshold. So it's definitely... Uh, something that's evolving. And so, uh, you know, I think conversations like this are really great and kind of broadening our collective knowledge. So uh, very happy to be here and uh, looking forward to again to uh, the discussion. Awesome, thanks. And now to introduce Michael. Um, so our speaker, Michael Hauser has been the architectural historian for the state of Washington for over 20 years um, and has a long record of helping homeowners uh, understand architecture and the history of their buildings. Currently, he manages the state and national register program to Washington State, uh, as well as Washington's unique heritage barn program, which you should all check out. Hauser helped bring uh, post-World War II resources to the state's focus by establishing the Nifty from the Last 50 initiative uh, in 2003, which initially documented over 300 mid-century modern buildings uh, across the state. As the city's go, as the, pardon me, as the state's go-to expert, he has reviewed uh, numerous post-war resources as part of the Section 106 process, uh, from small ranch houses to Cold War military facilities. His current pet projects include creating biographies of architects and designers who practice in Washington state. And he has recently developed a study of Seattle parade uh, of the Seattle Area Parade of Homes and the AI Seattle Times um, Home of the Month. Uh, and he own, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Idaho and a master's of science uh, in historic preservation from Eastern Michigan University. And we are very excited to have him here to talk to us about 1970s architecture. And this series is titled uh, The 70s Turn 50. So Michael, please tell us what you know. 
Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction. And Steve, I don't know, there's a lot of pressure here. I'll try it. I'll try and do a good job here. <laughs> Let me see if I can share my screen and how does that look? Can you all see that? Zoe, can you see that? Yep. Super. Well, that was, that was a great introduction because what I really want to talk about is um, just to kind of get everybody kind of in the mood to be thinking about these 1970s resources because uh, they are turning 50. You know, I'm a, I'm a historian, not a mathematician, but if you if you take 50 from today, the year today, right, we're up already into 1971, uh, hitting 1972 very quickly. And I think if you looked at the at the uh, amount of resources that are considered historic, um, certainly it's a lot. Um, but unfortunately, in the preservation community generally, we're quite behind the, the eight ball uh, in that sense, because there are not a lot of post-World War II buildings um, on the register um, in Washington state, either on the local register, or certainly not on the national register. Uh, there are none, uh, no post-World War II buildings on the national register or the state register in Tacoma. Um, there's no mid-century neighborhoods that are listed. Um, in fact, there's only three post-World War II houses on the National Register statewide, uh, which is kind of shocking, right? So when we talk about post-World War II, you know, we're up to 45 to 71, soon to be 72. So we've got a whole 30-year period there where we're uh, missing a lot of resources and have a lot of work to do to kind of catch up. Um, but hopefully we'll get there as we kind of uh, progress and move along. So today, what I wanted to do is just kind of share um, some initial thoughts on um, things that are out there uh, that you might be thinking about when you think about 70s architecture. It might be a little trip down memory lane for some of you, uh, might be new, um, that sort of thing. Uh, you know, in 70s architecture is a is a really a study of contradictions, if you will. So it's the austerity sort of versus decadence. There's drab earth tones versus campy colors. Uh, there's this whole idea of, you know, kind of nature loving hippie dumb uh, and even, you know, high tech futurism. You know, there's some fun, real contrasting things that kind of happen. Um, one of uh, American top novelists, uh, Tom Wolfe, he labeled the 1970s as sort of the me decade. Um, and he based this on this newfound sort of American, you know, kind of preoccupation with um, um, self discovery and self awareness during this sort of time period. I think you're going to see some of those themes as we as we look through here. And I thought I would just throw this in here. Uh, you know, I'm no experts on the 1970s, but I did grow up in 1970. Uh, that's me and uh, the little guy there with the with the cool outfit on and my folks. And, uh, you know, they were pretty hip. Uh, we had, you know, shag carpet, green shag carpets and uh, harvest gold walls and plants inside and uh, sort of crazy things. I grew up in Vancouver, actually. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, was submerged in 1970s culture, I guess, if you will, as a young age. I wanted to give you a little context first uh, before we start talking about architecture specifically, just to be thinking about what was going on during the 70s. And, you know, this is a time where we're sort of, you know, liberalism of the 1960s still is kind of continuing, if you will. Um, but particularly, there's this crusade to get more aware to become more aware of the environment um, and all the assaults that were sort of happening to it. Um, you know, America celebrated the first Earth Day um, in 1970. Um, Congress passed the National Environmental Environmental um, Policy Act um, that same year. Um, there was the Clean Air and the Clean Water Act also in the 70s um, in 1972. And then there was the Underground America Day in 1974. Uh, we have the oil crisis, obviously, in the 70s as well. Um, and then campaigns to uh, protect the environment, like, you know, don't give a hoot uh, or give a hoot, don't pollute, right? Or the, the famous, um, uh, you know, ad council series uh, featuring uh, the so-called Native American uh, paddling through the, the garbage and, and uh, on, on his canoe. And it's kind of an interesting side story about that. The gentleman who portrayed the Native American was actually an Italian American. Uh, so again, this sort of contrast and um, you know, confusion about where we want to be uh, long term. Also, the era you know of the anti-war movement, right? Lots of things happening. Uh, there are a few people, you know, continued uh, 
very few people really continued to support the, the war. You know, President Dixon, he really had a fear that the United States would look weak. So as a result um, of ending the war, um, he really didn't want to do that. He wanted to make the war more palatable, right? So he was limiting the draft. He started limiting the draft. He was shifting the burden of combat, not only from American troops, but to South Vietnamese soldiers. And that policy seemed to work for uh, a little bit. Um, however, when the United States uh, ended up uh, invading Cambodia in 1970, um, hundreds of thousands of protesters ended up clogging the streets of the U.S., um, college campuses, things of that nature. Um, on May 4th was a big day when uh, the National Guardsmen shot uh, four student protesters at an anti-war rally in Kent State University in Kansas. Um, Ten days later, police officers shot uh, two African-American students at Mississippi at Jackson State University. Uh, members of Congress tried to limit sort of the capacity of the president by re by revoking the Gulf of Tonkin uh, resolution, which authorized the use of military tr um, force. Uh, but Nixon, he simply just ignored it. All right. So there's all these things kind of brewing and happening during that time frame. Uh, there's the women's movement, too. Uh, that's happening at the same time. Right. A big group of American uh, feminists came together to um, fight for equal rights amendments um, in 1972. Um, 22 of the necessary states actually ratified uh, the uh, Equal Rights Amendment uh, right away, but um, there were the other states that seemingly sort of left behind and they lagged. In fact, um, it um, took another uh, five years for Indiana the, uh, to become the, the 35th state. They were the last one to um, rectify, uh, ratify the ERA. So alarmed with kind of this um, idea of uh, these disappointments by women rights activists, they started started to create their own um, way. They kind of began to turn away from politics a little bit. They built feminine communities um, on their own, built organizations dedicated to, to um, feminist things, art galleries, bookstores, conscious raising groups, um, daycare, women's health facilities, you name it. All these kinds of things are happening uh, in the 1970s as well. In contrast to that, though, um, we have something, you know, called the conservative backlash, right? So there's this group of really progressive sort of folks, and then there's the other folks um, called sometimes the silent majority. Um, and they were the ones who really swept um, uh, President Nixon into office in 1968. And they were mostly particularly white class, uh, middle class, uh, working class, middle class whites, um, mostly um after Nixon got uh, elected, he began to dissemble uh, all these sort of welfare um, things that happened. And, and of course, that began to foster lots of resentment. Uh, the 1970s also saw the uprise of, of Jerry Faldwell, um, you know, religious broadcaster and minister. He sort of comes to play and, and um, creates this moral majority um, um, group that's dedicated to, you know, pro-life and pro-family and pro-American, pro-morality. Uh, so that's in contrast to these other sort of movements that were going on. Uh, business leaders started to have think tanks uh, like the Heritage Foundation and the Cato Institute uh, to try and embrace religion uh, and big government and things of that nature. Together, these sort of leaders um, came forth and they um, you know, took more of a direct approach uh, in politics, really by hiring lobbyists to create um, PACs, you know, political action committees. Um, they pushed their agendas in the halls of Congress, um, things like that. Between 1976 and 1980, 80, uh, the number of these political groups, these PACs, um, rose from just about 300 to over 1,200 uh, just within four years. So they were a force to be reckoned with for sure. And those kinds of things led to this scandal, right, uh, of this re-election landslide by President Nixon in 1972. Um, but he kind of really, um, you know, resented any sort of challenge by authority and his attempts to... Um, uh, attempted to discredit those who disapproved of him. So uh, there was a burglary, a very noted burglary in the Watergate complex, hence called the Watergate scandal um, in D.C., which uh, there were four individuals that broke into the um, Democratic National Committee office, and um, they were caught, and Nixon uh, tried to intervene with that uh, uh, investigation by the FBI. And uh, that ultimately led to, um, instead of being impeachment, uh, uh, led to his resignation. 
There was also things at the time, you know, we have to look at fashion, crazy things that are happening. It was fun. It was a flamboyant time. Um, polyester uh, is the main choice. Bright colors were everywhere. Uh, chest hairs, uh, medallions, butterfly collars, bell bottoms, uh, skin tight T-shirts, sandals, leisure suits, uh, flower pattern dresses, uh, sideburns, you know, all these kinds of crazy things. Uh, men and women now uh, seem to be wearing uh, alike outfits, uh, tight fitting pants, platform shoes, both for men and women. Uh, just when it seemed like bell bottoms or flares couldn't get any bigger, um, they were gone. They just sort of disappeared. Uh, by the late 1970s, the pant suit um, and the leisure suit and the track suit was sort of the everyday kind of wear that uh, the person was sporting. Uh, every, every woman had this cowl neck sweatshirt in her closet. Uh, men had uh, striped V-necked uh, velour shirts in their drawers. Um, what colors, these colors, these bright colors that kind of started in the 1970s really almost disappeared by the late 1970s. And we go into things like earth tones and whites and grays and blacks. Um, so you'll see things like that. Then there's also this music revolution uh, as well. Um, a huge variety of music happening during the 1970s. Dozens of genres to sort of choose from. Uh, many of them rose in popularity um, at different points during the decade of the 1970s. There's funk, there's soul, there's R&B and pop and soft rock and disco, uh, all carved out a place for themselves during this time frame. In fact, in 1972, uh, you know, five of the top selling records in the US and 11 of the top selling 20 albums uh, were by African-American artists. So pretty exciting times. Things were changing, right? Uh, the 1970s also saw a birth of a new, younger sort of uh, music genre. You may have heard of it. It's called hip hop. That happened in the 1970s. That's when it first came about. And then you have things like automobiles. I'm a, I have a big passion for automobiles, but um, automobiles are really changing a lot during the 1970s as well, from the exotic, you know, Lamborghini that kind of shows up um, to uh, lots of federal regulations that change about how cars are looking, whether it's airbags that show up uh, first on a GM car in 1962 to uh, new regulations for bumpers, um, big bumpers and uh, safety protection, things of that nature. Uh, so in contrast with sort of the American um, uh, big muscle cars of the era, there was a, a uh, new recognition or a new entry into the market of fuel efficient cars as part of the oil crisis of 73, right? So we got a lot of cars imported from Japan and Korea and others. And finally, the U.S. Uh, market sort of takes notice as well, and they start shrinking their cars. So this is the Pinto and the Gremlin and the Civic and uh crazy things, uh, cars from those eras as well. Now, architecturally, we got kind of a background there. Uh, the 70s were really this era of exploration, if you will, for architectures. It was an era of a sort of experimentation, uh, a reckoning that would kind of shape how uh, architecture would, would happen through the remainder of the 20th century. And, and in fact, by this time, public sentiment had really begun to turn um, against urban renewal that was happening um, and projects that seemingly only architects would love, you know, sort of radical stuff kind of comes into question. And as an architectural community, as a preservation community, we're still trying to understand and grapple with these things because we're still trying to figure out what to call these things. So I'm a splitter. I like to split things up into small different categories and groups. And you know, these are just some of the terminologies that's thrown out there. And one of the reasons why we as architectural historians do this is so we can get a, a comparing and contrasting of um, different building types to say, hey, this is a really good example of a split level or a geodesic dome, or this is very unusual. It doesn't fit any of the known terminology. One of the problems, though, a big problem is that we can't seem to agree on what the terminology is, at least as a as a collective um, in terms of the nation. So I looked at um, split foyers, split entries, split levels, by levels uh, across the state to see what other states are calling them. And these are some guidebooks that are out there. So these are all, in essence, the same uh, form of house, uh, but they're all called something slightly different, right? 
So in Virginia, they call them a split forward. Um, in McAllister's guide, which is a very popular uh, architectural guidebook, she calls them bi-level splits. Uh, period catalogs are calling them raised ranches. Um, what's the correct terminology, right? What did we decide to do in Washington? Well, we decided to go with split foyer uh, is what we decided to do. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a minute after we look at some of these sort of designs and what the heck is a split foyer, right? How does that differ from a split entry? We first have to talk about style versus type though. So whenever I talk about architecture, I like to talk about these two things. So style really in the easiest mode is applied ornamentation to a building and form is defined by plan and the height of a building. So style and form are completely two different things, right? And when you're talking about the mid-century period, those things can get kind of fuzzy and, and uh, uh, complicated a little bit. Um, so I'll try and point out some of the differences. So we're gonna look at forms and we're gonna look at style that's applied to the same form and how different it looks, even though it's the same kind of form. Like ranch houses, right? These are a building form. A ranch house is a building form. And ranch houses in 1960, no, excuse me, in 1975, about 60% of the houses that were being constructed were one level houses, most likely ranch houses. So um, lots of ranch houses. That's an architectural form. It's one level, it's low to the ground, it's very horizontal. Um, lots of different styles can be applied to ranches. And I thought it'd be fun to look at these different style categories. Um, ranches themselves come from the idea of um, low-lying um, uh, buildings that were perhaps, you know, from the 1870s, ranches um, during the Southwest. Um, Sunset Ranch Western Houses book, which is a very popular, uh, influential book for the 1950s, actually talks about Fort Nisqually's Factor House as being one of the examples of an early ranch house. Uh, which is kind of interesting, right? Um, ranch houses are crazy because they are everywhere. They're all over the country, very popular. Um, lots of plan books out there that had free plan services where you could go and uh, you know go down to your local hardware store and get a free plan with the hope that they would somebody would buy the materials there, or you could order a plan online. Um, lots of advertisements in local newspapers, period publications, things like that but not all ranches look the same. So here's a ranch with some applied ornamentation, which we call storybook or Cinderella ornamentation. And, you know, when you look at these, they're little quaint little, you know, Cinderella Snow White cottages. I've also heard them called, you know, very low scale. And, uh, you know, you can see these kind of crazy little dove coats that are in the eave lines. You know, who thought it was a great idea to bring a bird, you know, into your attic of your house? Uh, I, I guess Snow White did, right? But probably not the greatest idea. So a lot of sculpted uh, barge boards or barge boards where the roof is connected together, brackets, uh, diamond pane windows. Um, those are kind of storybook houses from the time period of a ranch. But then you also have things that kind of have a little cowboy Western feel to them. So what's, what's more Western than having a wagon wheel added to your house, um, you know, or make your house kind of look like a barn, um, uh, you know, with a little um, hay hood overhang like this one house down in Vancouver. Um, there's no hay loft up this, but it, it uh, has a remnant feature of a barn. Uh, the house up in Lakewood, um, you know, kind of has a Western feel as well because of those little brackets under the eaves. When we're talking about ranch houses in a lot of stylistic terminology, you know, we look at small little details to pull out um, the examples of what can you capture? Are they the best examples of a cowboy? Probably not. There are some other high-end examples out there, but these are the ones that we sort of see in Washington state. Then there's also ranches that have kind of an Asian inspire um, to them where they have a gable on a hip roof, um, or maybe they have little flares at the eave lines um, that give them that Asian sort of look and feel to them. Panelized outside walls as well. Some great examples all over the state. Some that even are kind of reflective of what Frank Lloyd Wright was doing in the late 1950s of his Usonian sort of uh, uh, aspect of his 
of his a period and his uh, design philosophy. So, you know, these aren't great examples of Usonian architecture, but they have these massive uh, extra deep chimneys of uh, low eaves that where the windows come right underneath uh, the eave line. Um, windows that turn the corners, things like that, which are typical of those sort of Usonian flavors of Frank Lloyd Wright uh, during that time frame. Then you might even have uh, ranches that have a little Spanish flavor. We call these hacienda ranches, where they've got these arches and uh, tile roofs, red tile roofs and little courtyards and crazy things like that. Uh, you know, pretty easy to spot when you're out there driving around. Tacoma has some good examples of them. I haven't seen a collective neighborhood of these, but they're definitely peppered in um, all over the place. And then there's ones that, uh, you know, have this colonial America sort of thing. And colonial revival is something that, um, you know, starts way back, uh, you know, in colonial America. We talk about the revival. We re typically talk about things from the 1920s. I'm pushing the idea that this colonial revival, which sort of continues today, anything in the post-war two World War II era, uh, we would refer it to as early American designs. Um, and that's what they were sort of used, the terminology that was used during um, the time frame in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, this early American design. So they have a lot of sculpted um, brackets along the open uh, entryways, uh, little flower boxes and shutters. And uh, I guess these examples don't have any cupolas on the top of them, but it's a t another typical early American sort of design detail. And then you have some that are just kind of modern, right? They um, don't really have any um, garish architectural details, but they look modern. They look sleek. They have these windows that turn the corner. The eave lines are kind of cut off on the sides, uh, varying materials, lots of use of stonework, things of that nature. So you'll see these examples out there. So modern ranches. Well, the distant cousin to a modern ranch is something that we call the, the split level. Um, and well, what the heck is the split level? The split level is pretty easy to define because when you walk into a, a place, it's one floor and then you have the idea, uh, there's an interior style well where you can go up or down. So it has two more levels, like this little diagram that I'm showing you up at the top. So you enter on one level and then you can decide to go up or down after you have some living space on that level. That's the sort of character defining feature of a split level um, property. Again, this is a building form, not a style because there are different styles that are applied to these. Um, and split levels, a lot of people think, you know, split levels are kind of, you know, 60s, 50s sort of places, but in actuality, split levels um, date clear back into the late 1930s. Um, so we'll find some early examples um, here in Washington State, actually in the 40s, particularly up in the Seattle, um, Olympia, I've seen a couple in Tacoma as well. And it was a hot, hot design at the time. Um, lots of articles about split levels, um, lots of uh, discussion in newspapers and things of that nature. Now we um, also define split levels, you know, I'm a splitter, right? So we can start cutting split levels down into subcategories to figure out again, what the examples are. And I've started drawing some graphics. I didn't quite finish the, the last one here, the raised rear, but these are the four sort of types of split levels that you'll see out here. The classic, which is a gable and a cross gable next to it. And then the side-by-side, -side, so two gables side-by-side, -side. the flying wing, is the one big huge roof. And then the raised rear is a, is one where you enter on the front and then the, the stepping is done on the back of the house. Those are more rare examples. Few of those around, but not too many. Here's some examples of the classic uh, subgenre, I guess, if, of the split level. And you can see how different and varied they look, right? Depending on those stylistic details that's applied to them. Here's the flying wing example. Most of these tend to have um, you know, more of that modern sort of look, if you will, with um, floor to ceiling windows and exposed rafter tails, um, or not exposed rafter tails, exposed purlins rather. Those are the big beams that are kind of sticking out on the top. Um, here's some side by side examples, uh, ones that have a colonial sort of flavor to them or that early American flavor, like the, the one down in Vancouver that has a garrison up on the top. That's that little overhang with the little brackets underneath that. That's called a garrison. There's actually a garrison style from the 1930s. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a throwback to that. Um, 
That's the side by side. Um, and then here's some different ideas about style that are applied to these, um, you know, little Tudor elements. That's kind of weird or Spanish elements uh, or storybook elements to a split level. Then there's also a little another category of a split level that's called the split entry, right? So we talked about that before. The difference between this guy is that you enter uh, the buildings in between all the stories, right? So there's only two stories, but there is a small little entrance way where you come to a uh, foyer, if you will, and you've got the immediate decision to go up or down as soon as you walk into the door. So that's the split foyer or the split entry idea. So it's three levels, but one level really is just the foyer. So the split level or the split entry rather um, also dates back a little bit earlier to the 1960s, but uh, becomes very popular uh, in the 1970s. And again, you'll see different um, sort of roof forms, uh, different subcategories of these, different styles that are applied to these as well. Um, around the state and around the country. Um, you know, here's even one over in Richland that's got an A-frame attached to the front of it. Uh, you know, a weird deal, right? So what do you call that? Is that an A-frame or is it a split level or is it a split level with an A-frame? Uh, what style is it? Uh, it can get very confusing pretty, pretty quickly, uh, but interesting to sort of look at the different typologies that are out there. Nobody is, um, documenting these or uh, let alone, I haven't really seen any um, books or scholarly study on split levels or split entries. A little bit on split levels, but definitely nothing yet on split entries. Um, so if you're looking for a topic to do some research on, uh, that would be a great one. Sort of dig into it. I'm, I'm kind of digging into it myself, but uh, have just barely scratched the surface. Here's some Tudor or Spanish style examples on a split level with those details, uh, you know, stucco and curves and fake uh, boards on the outside. Here's some early American examples with these huge columns that span the first and second story. You know, what are they trying to do uh, here? What they're trying to do is they're trying to mimic. Uh, Thomas, uh, excuse me, not Thomas Jefferson. This is um, Mount Vernon. This is uh, George Washington's house. Uh, they're trying to sort of simulate that idea of uh, this house that looks grand and historic uh, with this colonial style entranceway. And um, you can see the, some of the entranceways on these two houses in Olympia and Kirkland in particular that have that classic uh, broken pediment above the door with a little scooped out and a little knob on the top, a little finial. And if you look at a lot of those, the little finial is actually a pineapple. Uh, that's a symbol of welcome, uh, kind of a fun little detail. Then you could have something like this, right? You're like, what are you talking about, Michael? You're talking about Pizza Huts. I get excited about these because they're what we call pavilions. Uh, you could live in a pavilion if you want. And these are easy to spot too because they have this very strange sort of roof structure, if you will, a hip, um, a hip roof with four slopes. And then they got another hip on the top of them, which is usually hiding something, um, hiding the air conditioning, hiding a chimney, um, hiding a uh, maybe a skylight, um, things of that nature. And the, the, the pavilion style really did start out with um, Pizza Hut restaurant uh, in 1962. They came up with that initial design and then it started to go mainstream pretty quickly after that. And so you can find these designs not only on houses, but fair buildings and commercial buildings and religious buildings. Um, you'll find it all over the place if you look for it, right? So I wanted to show you some examples of some of the things that are out there. A lot of fair buildings during the time period had these sort of ideas of these little small pavilions um, that were hooked together. So here's an example that was set up for the Century 21 uh, exhibit up in Seattle in 1964. Uh, here's some later examples uh, that are found around the state of these little pavilions. Uh, strange little pieces of architecture. So these are residential examples. Um, note the different sort of tops of the roof. Some of them might be uh, an extra little pagoda up at the top, or they might have an extra gable. Um, they might be hiding something, or they might be just be there for decorative purposes. They almost have an Asian sort of um, uh, connection to them or a look to them. Then there are, you know, there are banks that have these details, uh, commercial buildings, churches. 
the pavilion form. And of course there's Pizza Huts. And if you get into these things like I do, Pizza Huts, the original Pizza Huts, you know, they're quickly disappearing actually. So if you've got one in your community, uh, you should get excited about it and at least document it um, and try and preserve it. One of the most intact ones that I found is the one up in Lakewood. Um, a lot of them have been severely remodeled uh, over the years. So it's great to see that one fairly intact. Um, so think about those, the historic pizza huts. What about something like this, A-frames? Everybody loves A-frames, right? Um, they're easy to spot because they look like a giant A on the outside with that steep, big um, roof that comes all the way down to the ground. And um, you can find these kinds of things all over the state, whether it's um, in a residential neighborhood or as a cabin. And one of the most influential A-frames that is out there actually nationwide or maybe even worldwide is one right here in Olympia. Um, that's a fun story to tell. This is Dr. Hellier's cabin and some of you from uh, Tacoma and Pierce County might recognize that name. Dr. Hellier is the main mover and driver behind, um, um, oh, what am I thinking? Behind uh, the, uh, oh, I, I totally lost it. The zoo out by Graham. <laughs> Somebody jump in there, will you? <laughs> Steve, you know what I'm talking about, right? The petting zoo out by Graham. Maybe Zoe. Anyways, he right, we got um, a comment there. Northwest Trek. Northwest Trek. Thank you so much. Somebody <laughs> saved me. Yes, he's the guy behind and, Northwest and Trek. Dash. Yes, <laughs> um, and he's kind of this Renaissance guy, and he. Um, decided to go to the Douglas Fir Plywood Company and tell them about his uh, design that he was building. And he said, hey, I'll let you take pictures of my property if you donate uh, the materials for um, the building. And they went and photographed it. And then they sold plans based on his design literally all over the world. So this A-frame in Olympia is sort of the, the mother earth of uh, A-frames. It all started right here in Olympia with this property. So it's pretty exciting to, to sort of have that with us. Lots of different types of A-frames that you can see out there based on their roof structure as well. Um, whether, it's, whether it's a straight A-frame or an arched A-frame or an A-frame with a flat top, um, you name it, lots of different things, lots of different um, building uses for that, whether it's cabins out there um, that you can find, um, you know, pretty much in any forest environment, to individual houses, to churches, to single family residential properties, um, some cabin examples up at Mount Rainier, um, and up at the beach, um, up in the forest, lots of examples out there. One of the other styles that really comes into play um, is the shed style um, in the 1970s. The shed style, it really is um, the 70s quintessential uh, architectural piece. And unlike the A-frames, this building has a geometric shape where there's only one uh, sloped roof. And they're like attached boxes that have different slopes roofs coming all different ways. And they're typically two stories tall. Um, they're taking into this idea as well of um, some environmental concerns, i.e. using these tall sides pointing towards the sun, maybe to soak in the sun and um, use sun as a heating possibility. Um, the design really starts out and gets um, developed down in um, California, down at Sea Ranch Condominiums um, in 1965. They were the first uh, really design and it kind of went wildfire from there and caught on very rapidly with other uh, architects all across the country, um, featured in a lot of magazines. And then local builders kind of took that high end sort of architecture that you might see at Sea Ranch and they adopted it sort of at the local level. Some not the greatest examples of, of shed style, but if you had to call them anything, um, that's what they would be called. And so um, they use the idea of this slanted roof and diagonal siding um, to create their versions of Sea Ranch. Um, there's residential examples, there's restaurant examples, there's medical examples, bowling alley examples, um, very popular in the 1970s, the shed style. Even there's even uh, church examples, right? So easy ecclesiastical examples. 
the McLiving. We talked about Pizza Huts, but we've got to talk about McDonald's. Houses like this that have mansard roofs. This is the mansard style of the 1970s. And um, the mansard uh, is, a, is a throwback uh, from uh, to the 1880s, to the Second Empire style. And these are what you see on the McDonald's of the 1970s. This was the new look of the 1970s. Um, and uh, it also went pretty crazy at wildfire and lots, lots of examples can be found on there on different types of architecture. Some of these have a um, French kind of colonial sort of feel to them. Others have a very modern sort of feel to them. Uh, they're kind of all over the place in terms of if that mansard roof, that second story um, roof encloses the second floor with a flat top. Sometimes it goes all the way down to the ground. Sometimes it's propped up on a building. Sometimes the mansard has little flared eaves as well. Again, other examples of mansards out there. There's even uh, the one in Bellevue, that's a split level mansard, right? So you enter on one floor, you go in, you can go up and down once you're inside. Living space on that one floor that you enter. And I guess the one down in Vancouver there is a split entry mansard. Lots of residential examples in terms of multifamily examples using the mansard style from the time period as well. And commercial examples too. A lot of uh, commercial buildings were using the mansard as an easy way to cover up their downtown building facades to sort of modernize them during the 1970s. Uh, fortunately for us, a lot of these things have been removed, but you'll find some straggler examples out there of the, the covering up of the facade with a, a faux mansard roof in the 1970s as well. I also wanted to talk about Bucky. Do you guys know about Bucky? Buckminster Fuller. He's the guy that is developing this geodesic dome, a new type of architecture. Uh, easy to spot, right? Because they look like, um, you know, almost radar towers or something like that. They're using these triangular forms to create a sphere shape. Uh, and there's all different sort of subgenres of them as well. Buckminster Fuller develops the geodesic dome in the late 1950s, uh, but they don't really start to catch on, at least in a residential application, until the late 1970s uh, and the late 1960s, and particularly in the 1970s, start to show up. And um, they kind of go mainstream. Buckminster Fuller actually came out to Washington State and did a lecture series up at the UW Architecture School. Um, you'll find these at fair buildings. You know, Epcot has a geodesic dome. Um, um, Tacoma's connection is pretty cool because they're one of the few communities in Washington State that had a cathedral light dome sales office um, where you would go in and order from a catalog your dome and it would be made in a factory and then it would be shipped to your site wherever it was close to Tacoma or somewhere else in the state. Um, this is a period catalog and I do have a photo in here of the sales office in Tacoma. Um, couple slides here. So here's some examples of how different these things can look, but they all have those character defining features of the wood triangular form. They can also be metal as well, but typically the ones that we see here in the Pacific Northwest are wood. Um, the insides are just as funky as the outsides for sure. Um, here's some metal ones. There's the geodesic cathedral light dome office in Tacoma. Uh, that's over by Tacoma Mall. So it's still there. I think it's being used as a church now. And of course, the, the biggest geodesic dome, maybe some people don't consider it a geodesic dome, is the Tacoma Dome. A little bit later than the 1970s, but certainly conceived in the 1970s. Uh, it's actually the largest geodesic dome, uh, wood geodesic dome uh, in the US. So that's kind of a cool feature. The micro dome bingo hall up in Milton, Milton, excuse me, outside of Fife there, um, is one that's built out of fiberglass. So another weird one close by. What about living under the earth? Who thought that was a good idea, right? These are earth shelters, things that are actually built into the ground or on top of the ground, and then earth is scooped over the top. Another kind of classic, you know, sort of 1970s 
um, type that you might find out there. And um, very, very popularized, starts to be popularized in the 1970s by a guy named Malcolm Wells. Um, he is very influential in pushing his ideas about earth designs and how um, sensitive they are to the environment. There's new magazines that come out. There's lecture series that's um, traveling lecture series. Uh, these kinds of uh, houses show up at home fairs and things like that, where they do a sample model or a piece of an earth shelter to try and get people excited about building their own earth shelters. So here's an advertisement of a lecture series by the Washington Aggregates and Concrete Association up at SeaTac Motor Inn to try and teach people how to build an earth shelter. Um, I found this map in one of those earth shelter magazines that kind of shows the location of earth shelters. We don't really know where they are. There's very few that are recorded. Um, tough to see because they kind of blend in with our built environment. But as you can see from Washington State, um, there are dots in Washington State. There seems to be a greater number over on the dry side of the state, but we certainly have them uh, here in Western Washington as well. Uh, here's some examples of how different they look, depending again on sort of if it's a full earth shelter where the earth covers the complete roof or they're just using earth shelter on the side to sort of get those energy qualities um, to the building as well. And notice they all have a different sort of stylistic characteristic to them as well. Some of them look very um, uh, modern. Some of them look very, uh, you know, Hobbit-like. Um, some of them have a Asian sort of theme, uh, like the Rice Paddy restaurant up in Seattle. Different sort of design details as well. And I, the last 70s thing I wanted to talk to you about is a new sort of passion of mine. And I know my wife's out there. She's probably laughing at me because I'm trying to get her to, when we drive around, to go into uh, mobile home parks. Uh, because they're an interesting typology, something that really hasn't been very studied very well, but they're coming into their own in the 1960s and the 1970s, particularly in the 1970s, because uh, we see a change in um, the design based on the size of a mobile home. So in 1974, there was um, some legislation passed, not only here in Washington State, but um, nationwide that allowed for the infamous double wide to sort of happen. So now you could put bigger double wide buildings driving down the street, right? So you cut it in half, but now you could go from a 10 foot to a 14 foot, um, and that would allow you to get the double wide. So I like to look at the earlier ones, these single wide ones. They're sort of fun and crazy. You can look at some of the details of them uh, and figure out where they were built because they're all factory built, right? Um, you can also look at not only the design of the mobile home itself, but sort of the bird's eye view and how the mobile home park is laid out. There's some pretty interesting uh, mobile home parks out there as well. Things that are, you know, done in the round or how they're arranged on the ground. Um, you can look at the details and figure out who the builders were. So here's just a compilation of some of the builders out there. Uh, there were factories right here in Washington uh, that were building mobile homes uh, that were specific to Washington State. Um, uh, so that's kind of fun to sort of see as well. So we need to kind of think about those. I'm going to finish up with what I think are the 10 sort of top, you know, kind of design details for the 1970s uh, that, that are out there. It's just kind of a fun thing to sort of look at. I would, there's so many more, but these are what, ones that I thought would be fun to look at. So. The number one is what I call shag fest, right? So at one time, shag carpets, you know, in the 1970s, they came in all kinds of colors um, that are almost laughable by today's standards, right? So we get shag, you know, those long, loopy, you know, these eye-watering sort of hues from lime green to oceanic blue uh, to acidic orange, uh, you know, impossible to clean. Uh, we uh, had shag carpets, which I mentioned at home, and I remember many times that my mom's like, hey, we're having company, go rake the carpet. And so you had the carpet rake. You know, the heck with the vacuum cleaner, you just raked the shag carpet that looked like it was vacuum, but you didn't actually vacuum it, you just scraped it. And they had, you know, specific shag rakes. So we just had a regular rake because we were too cheap, I guess, but uh, uh, shag carpet, you know, it's everywhere long shag on the stairs, on the walls, uh, on the ceilings, in the bathroom, shag carpet is everywhere. And then there's, you know, macrame. 
as decorative wall hangings, right? Uh, macrame really can trace its sort of origins back to ancient times, but we see that these sort of knotted fiber wall hangings, these elaborate macrame plant holders, you know, you're really instantly kind of transported to the 1970s when you see these kinds of things. Um, the 1970s is kind of this craft revival, right? So you have, you know, you have macrame, but you have, you know, string art, um, embroidered wall hangings, afghans, um, owl-shaped knickknacks are also very popular. So you see a photo of these owl-shaped knickknacks. You know, what is the connection between owls in the 1970s? We think. Uh, that it uh, traces it back to 1971 when the U.S. Forest Service, they made the owl um, their feathered friend and their mascot. And so there was lots of excitement around the owl during that time frame as well. There's also what I call stone, right? Everybody gets stoned. Everybody had stone in their houses, on the outside of their houses, on the inside of their houses. Heavy, dark stone with dark mortar, stone fireplaces, accent walls, stone to create your fireplace, uh, or even a waterfall in this crazy example um, up in Lakewood. Uh, stone everywhere during the time frame. I've been trying to figure out um, what types of stones these are, what are they called? And um, I'm having a heck of a time trying to figure it out. Uh, period publications during the time have, you know, proprietary sort of uh, names for those. Um, you know, a certain type of stone that, that uh, uh, you know, looks a certain way could be called something here in the Pacific Northwest and the exact same stone could be called a completely different thing uh, in the Midwest, even though it's the same kind of stone. Uh, we seem to have gotten a lot of stone from uh, Utah, Southwest sort of area. There's a lot of Mount Shuckleston stone, uh, which is a green stone. There's a lot of white um, granite, uh, which you'll see as well. And of course, basalt and feather stone and rock stone and all kinds of weird sort of names out there. And then there's the plastic, fantastic. The age of plastics, you know, during the 70s, where there's lots of experimentation going on with plastics, not only in the design sort of realm, but also sort of the idea of plastics being combustible or off-gassing or heat retention or heat loss. How could you sort of use it, uh, you know, in your, not only inside, but outside, or maybe even for an entire building material. Um, so you have, you know, things like polypropylene and formica and plexiglass and PVC and vinyl and styrofoam and fiberglass and acrylic, all different types of sort of plastic, um, you know, happening at that time used for different products on the house, whether it's furniture or siding or roofing or insulation or outlet boxes, um, interior finishes. Um, you remember contact paper, right, to cover up your walls, your drawers, your tables, total 1970s application. Hello, nature. Also a big 1970s sort of deal when your idea was to bring the outside of the house in. Um, and so you had wood paneling. Um, wood paneling not only, you know, on, in your house, but maybe on your dishwasher, on your car, the wood paneled car, sidecar, the alarm clock you know, faux wood paneling everywhere. There's interior gardens, there's plexiglass um, uh, lights, uh, greenhouses, all those kinds of things, you know, sort of inviting uh, nature into the inside of your house. Atriums, you name it. Beers were a big thing in the 1970s as well. And, you know, a uh, big trend, not only on lamps and walls, um, even ceilings from the 1970s, and it also kind of goes with this whole do-it-yourself sort of movement of the 1970s as well, because you could go down to uh, your local hardware store, you could go to Sears, you could go to J.C. Penney's, and you could buy these 12 by 12 mirrored panels uh, that would just adhere to the wall with sticky tape. Uh, and you could create a whole entire wall with mirrors. Uh, and some of those mirrors, you know, would just be a straight mirror. Some of them had little marbling effect to them. Some of them had little scenes that were painted on them. You know, crazy kinds of things like stylized animals and biplanes, super graphics, uh, just about any pattern you can think of could be found on these walls. We had a huge wall in our house of mirrors uh, that I remember growing up as well. 
There's also this idea of sort of this tropical adventure, right? So rattan, caning, bamboo materials uh, are all in a huge abundance sort of happening during the 1970s for plant stands, coffee tables, seating, design details, um, you name it. Remember the peacock chair? Super, super popular in the 1970s, Dolly Parton sitting in the peacock chair. Now, while rattan was really popular in canings, um, wicker, you know, those kinds of things are different things, right? So rattan is actually um, the material itself. Rattan is the material. Rattan is a solid sort of reed. Uh, unlike bamboo, which is um, hollow, rattan is actually um, a solid. So you can make lots of nice solid furniture with rattan and um, wicker is the weaving of the rattan. So that's the difference. So uh, rattan is the material, the wicker is the technique of weaving things together, of weaving the rattan together, or in this case, strips of rattan, right? Or bamboo or grasses or things like that. Also super popular during that time frame. Phony Colony. We talked about these early American sort of designs. Uh, you can call these early American. You can call it bicentennial chic. Um, the colonialization of America uh, continued into the 1970s and really took off with the bicentennial of America in 1976, uh, right? So we were commending the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of the Independence, uh, the revolution in very different ways. And, you know, the furniture might be complete um, you know, a takeoff of an exact replica of something that you could find uh, during colonial America from the 1700s, or it might be a, a big sort of departure and just have a little uh, American eagle slapped onto the outside. Uh, everyday objects uh, were used and, you know, called early American. I love the one that says, no kidding, an early American air conditioner. It looks like it has louvered vents on it right there in the middle crazy kinds of things. Um, people were uh, excited about this sort of nostalgia era, right? They seem to be permeating from sort of American culture in general, from these fashion trends to movies, you know, American graffiti, television shows, Little House on the Prairie, um, Happy Days, the Waltons, you know, all kind of hearkening back to these early days of American life, better days of American life. And of course, there's color. Lots and lots of color during the 1970s. Early, it's bright, um, it's flamboyant. In the later of the 1970s, becomes more subdued, uh, more of those earth tone colors. So there's, you know, we everybody knows the harvest gold and the avocado green and the warm sand colors, the brick, the rust, the burnt orange. Um, those sorts of things uh, start to appear in the 1970s. Um, on just about everything you could get in a color, right? So sinks, toilets, bathrooms, kitchen faucets, everything came in a color. The last thing is embracing the future, right? So you have all these people that are kind of interested in this natural sort of bohemian kind of lifestyle. Then you had the early American kind of people that are interested in the more traditional. And then you had another set of the, the population that was more interested in the space age, sort of embracing the future and what it could be like. So there's, um, you know, metal things like a chrome and polysteel and geometric shapes and lines and plastic and fiber optic, um, 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 lights and lava lamps, um, those sorts of things uh, begin to appear as well. You know, during this time frame, kitchens uh, were more functional. Um, they were more uh, logical. They had a bunch of storages. Um, dishwasher is uh, no longer a luxury item. And so how do you incorporate all these things to sort of embrace the future? With these kinds of things, how do you research this stuff? Uh, and I always sort of th knew the day was coming when these things would become historic in my lifetime. And, uh, you know, you have to sort of dig, right? And so the time is now to sort of uh, look for period publications. I like to look at period publications um, and, and buy a lot of those at garage sales and, and uh, antique stores to try and understand what was popular at the time. There's still not a lot written about the era in academia, uh, but we're going to get there. There's lots of old magazines that are online that you can find. One of my favorite is through the U.S. Modernist Archive. If you haven't checked out their website, um, definitely do that. Um, Dokomo Moiwa is a great organization as well. Um, they're an international organization that stands for the documentation and conservation of the modern movement. And the WIWA is the Western Washington chapter. 
Um, so uh, join that organization. It's free. They have lots of home tours. They have lots of information on their websites. Um, we also have information on our website. Um, so certainly lots to think about and lots to discover during this 1970s. I guess I wanna challenge you to kind of embrace the era and be thinking about what's coming down the pipeline, uh, what really is already here. Um, and uh, get your groove on, it's time. You're too late if you haven't gotten your groove on. <laughs> I am here to answer questions. I know that was a little long, Zoe, but we're right at seven. So not too bad. Yeah, no, that was amazing. And I have so many thoughts and so many questions. We have a couple in the chat. First, I wanna say thank you to everyone in the chat who threw up Northwest Trek. I was thinking that, and then I was like, I don't know if that's the right place. Is Ooh. it near Graham? I can't remember. Yeah. It totally is. <laughs> And uh, there, it also made me think of, there is also um, uh, Dr. Um, Hellier's, uh, he has a cabin at Northwest Trek that I believe is also built in the 70s. And I, it's either an A-frame or it's a split level A-frame or something I, cool. I think it's an A-frame as well. It's on the island uh, out there in the middle of the, the park. It's surrounded by a... Some water. Yeah, it's a great little property as well. Never Very formally clearly, documented. Yeah, yeah clearly loved uh, A-frames and being out in nature, which yeah. we can all agree with. Um, we have um, a couple questions about how many, um, how many buildings and um, houses came out of Sears, Robux and Co. Uh, kit homes and um, I think someone in the uh, someone in the chat also mentioned that they built one of their houses off of um, one of the designs from the last uh, the, one of the last slides um, on cabins. But oh, yeah, cool. well, how how many of those do we have? Um, that's a good question. Um, no one knows. <laughs> uh, that's that's an easy answer. So Sears Kids Houses, you know, Sears started developing kid houses. A little off topic, but. Um, Clear back into the you know turn of the century 1905 1910 era, and all the way up into the right before the war, late 1930s 40s. Um, nobody has ever systematically. There's no master list anywhere. So to know that you have a kit house, um, you really have to either find the original plans or understand some of the markings that are on um, beams and uh, joists. Um, but the problem is, is there's lots of kit house companies. So Sears and Robux, they had a kit house company, also Montgomery Wards, but there were a lot of local um, businesses um, that also had kit houses. So here in Tumwater, there was a Tumwater Lumber Company that had a very thriving kit house company in the teens and 20s. Um, there's Fender Manufacturing Company out of um, Portland that also we know have uh, buildings in Washington State. When you get into this post-war era, um, we are talking about modular housing. So now it's not called kit houses, it's called modular housing, which was built in a factory. So we talked about mobile homes, but there's actually um, complete homes that are built in factories and then shipped to site. Those aren't on wheels, but they get you know put on a trailer and taken off a wheel and maybe um, assembled on site or partially assembled in the factory or maybe just uh, certain wall panels. That's certainly a whole nother discussion. Um, so that's modular homes versus mobile homes versus kit homes, right? Can get pretty confusing. Good question. I had um, I had some wonderings about, um, you know, we talked a little bit about environmentalism and I know brutalism starts in the 1950s, but has a continuation. Um, and I know that we have a couple examples of, uh, I grew up next to Evergreen State College. So that's a very, um, has that sort of sustainability kind of vibe to it, but then is all in um, concrete. And you have um, along with the Freeway Park in Seattle, which was a straight um, environmental uh, response to, we have a freeway in the middle that's going right through the middle of the city. How are we going to, um, you know, a lot of people didn't like it. A lot of people were like, how you, how do we cross over between this? You split the, split the city right in the middle. And we came up in the, um, 
think it's 1971 or 72 that they built the um, Freeway Park, which is right next to the convention center where now everyone goes for Comic-Con um, to take photos, but is an amazing um, example of that um, grassroots response to, you know, um, wanting to continue to have an, um, an environmental impact, but sort of that, you know, shift in between the two, the, the tension between the two um, of advancing and, and um, development, but then also trying to uh, fight against and keep nature still in the city. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. And then I was also wondering about the wire, um, I'm totally going to mispronounce it, but Wirehauser building? Warehouser? Warehouser? Warehouser. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, no relationship to Michael Hauser, but yes, I, I know the building. Well, let me tell you, let me just talk about, mention briefly brutalism, right? So the examples that I showed you really, you know, have a residential connection, right? Um, so we didn't really talk about commercial sort of design, sort of stylistic details. Um, so brutalism, there are very few um, residential properties that were designed as the brutalist style. So the brutalist style is mainly exposed raw concrete, bets and brute is where the name comes from. Uh, it does start to show up in the 1950s, but doesn't really show up here in the United States until the late 60s, 70s. In fact, the one of the few, probably the only brutalist house that I know of in Washington State is actually on Gravelly Lake. So in Tacoma, at Lakewood, and it's an amazing example, architect designed, obviously. Um, you know, brutalism never caught on as a sort of a Main Street architecture uh, due to a variety of reasons, particularly in the Pacific Northwest, you know, kind of saw it off as a, a cold, sort of dark and damp with our weather. Um, and so, you know, those buildings aren't very loved, um, certainly not by the general public, but probably more by academia. I think people are finally coming around. Tacoma also has one of the best examples of a brutalist style church, uh, St. Mark's in Tacoma up in um where is that? Just uh, right by um, Wright Park. Um, so cool examples. The Warehouser complex, um, you know, is it brutalism? Is it not brutalism? What it really is, um, is a skyscraper that's turned on its side that expands over uh, a precipice, um, which is kind of an interesting idea. It almost acts as a dam because there's a lake in front of it. Um, that building, um, it's a super important building. Um, it is, uh, as we all know, Weyerhaeuser, um, which started in Tacoma, um, moved their headquarters there in the 1970s, um, created this whole campus uh, designed by a very known architectural firm out of, uh, out of New York, uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill, uh, who had offices in Portland. Skidmore Owings and Merrill actually did a building in downtown Tacoma. But the Weyerhaeuser complex uh, was studied by generations of architects still is today. It is now vacant. Weyerhaeuser moved out. They moved to downtown Seattle. Um, we don't know what's going to happen to the building. Um, we hope that it will be saved. Uh, they're having a hard time, especially during you know COVID times, filling up uh, space, getting somebody to use the building. Um, we'll see what happens. It has no protection on the building itself. Um, so it's not a designated property. Um, there's no preservation program in federal way. Um, it's not on the National Register. Um, it's really just the uh, the will of the owners, um, whom we have talked to, and they are interested in preservation for sure, but they do have some different ideas about the campus, um, which are in contrast to some of the ideas that the local community has. Um, so they are a business, um, so they will be, you know, it was really more of a large campus. They will be cutting off some of the pieces of that campus and doing infill. Um, which may or may not affect the integrity of the campus, uh, but it's definitely going to change. So we're at least hoping that they can save the main building and sort of the view shed that you see from the from the freeway. Uh, so those of you that don't know, this building is at the intersection of I-5 and uh, what is that? Um, is it 510 that crosses over into Auburn? It's right above 5 or right around 5. Yeah, yeah. So great building. Do we know that's a whole the whole other lecture? Excuse me. Yeah. Do we know who the owners are? That's a question in the comments. Um, we do. It's a development firm out of California. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I was going to add to that. I I almost feel like it reminds me a little bit of the Earth Shelters. I mean, not you know, yeah. same exactly, but it kind of has that. 
integrated with the landscape feel, which I think is kind of, you know, obviously one of those features of the earth shelters. And I, I really enjoyed your discussion of those. And, um, you know, one thing that came to my mind is just how many of those are left? Like, how well are they standing up? Like, I would think that they would have structural issues, you know, being somewhat buried or having landscape elements literally enveloping them, that they must have, you know, particular issues, weathering problems that other buildings might not have. So I, I wonder just kind of like from your research, you know, are they less common or becoming less common because of some of those, some of those issues and concerns? Yeah, good question, Steve. Um... They, people are still building them today. Um, in fact, I know of one that just went up outside of Wenatchee. Uh, and so, you know, with today's sort of building technology is a lot different than it was in the 1970s, right? So a lot more concern, uh, um, a lot more understanding about how water penetrates um, buildings and surfaces. The ones that I do know of that are standing in Washington state uh, are, are holding up pretty well. Actually, um, the one at Lapaway Park State Park outside of Pullman um, is very well known, still lived in uh, and loved, and they aren't having any issues with that. Um, most of the examples that we see over here just have berms that go up on a sidewall, so not all the way up over the roof. So they're bermed earth shelters. It's a little bit more sort of exposure. Uh, and there's different ways that those things can be constructed. So they could be concrete, they could be steel, um, they could be some sort of fiberglass materials. There was a, a kit that you could buy um, that uh, you know was easily sort of plopped down, made in a factory, plopped down sort of as a shape, and then you could just pour your dirt over the top of it. So lots of different scenarios uh, of that and how it might hold up or not. But the ones that I know of are holding up pretty well but don't know a lot of them because they're just not being recorded out there, right? Because mm -hmm. they're hard to find because they blend in with the landscape. <laughs> love it. Um, another thing that I really loved that you talked about was um, the Pizza Hut pavilions um, as well as McDonald's. Um, and I'm wondering, what I'm, one of this is a very popular thing on the internet for um, younger people loving finding um, uh, ch chain restaurants that are time capsules of a certain era. And I'm wondering, uh, you know, you mentioned the ones that we've seen, but how is preservation going for these places? Is it something that, um, you know, is, is more easily able to happen because it's not residential and it's commercial, you know, where are we with a lot of those buildings? Are they just yeah. things you just happen to have to find? Yeah, good question, Zoe. I would say that um, it's not going well um, because so so a lot of these buildings um, are franchises, right? Um, so they're not owned by the corporate giant, um, but they do get funding and help from the corporate America. Not only um, you know restaurants, but things like automobile dealerships, um, and you get incentives for updating your buildings, right? So for instance, um, I know that there was a, a Ford dealership of an Everett that recently got, it was totally intact. It was in the round uh, or it was a Dodge dealership actually. But anyways, they uh, were not able to get like one of the newest models of cars because they had an old showroom. And so <laughs> once they remodeled and brought it up to speed, they now are allowed to sort of carry that that new automobile. And so the same thing is happening with those restaurants. So lots of McDonald's are getting remodeled. The one in Olympia um, completely got demolished down to bare ground and a new McDonald's went up. There was nothing wrong with the old one, but you know, new is better. No. Did I say that? No, new is not better. <laughs> I, think, I think there's... Um... I think if it's the one that's in um, that's near the mall, there is a Wendy's right next to it that is still historic yes. and is still done in that um, 70s sort of. I, I'm not sure if it's late 70s, but it, it's very um, Western um, kind of style. Yeah. That's a good one. There's an old uh, Arby's sign over by the um, Tacoma uh, Mall. They're on 50. Is at 51st? Um, that the actual store is new, but they've retained the old big 
giant Arby neon sign. Um, so that's cool to have as well. Yeah, I was going to add to that. I think it's also a hard pill to swallow for a lot of people that the idea, I mean, by nature, fast food restaurants, you know, I don't think people are thinking of them as, you know, high style architecture or kind of even interpreting them or thinking of them as vernacular architecture in that way. They're, they're, they're so many people, it's just a fast food restaurant. So I think the idea of, you know, I think of, I, I love the old Taco Bells that have the kind of mission style roof form and you can still see those even when they've been repurposed for another restaurant they stand out but you know again maybe as they become more rare it might be you know something that people begin to appreciate but you know yeah hopefully it's not too late before that happens i i just you know i think it's it's hard for people to think of a fast food restaurant as you know potentially significant for any reason yeah, yeah. Steve, I'm thinking of Sherry's restaurants, right? This as being an earth shelter. You yeah. know, they're in the round and they've got a lot of earth pushed up to the outsides of them and they're super distinctive. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I wanted to um go back to residential and sort of bring up um interiors and um the last uh couple slides that you had on what were the top ten most popular things. And what I've found really interesting is we're currently going through a um, like post uh, minimalism aesthetic and now everything is bringing, being brought up and now everyone is um, into uh, whatever you would call the opposite of minimalism, um, eclecticism or something. But uh, <laughs> I know macrame, uh, macrame is becoming really popular along with house plants and um, bringing in a lot of these 1970s um, elements. And I wonder if there's, um, you know, how, how it's just an interesting part of um, revamping new styles every 20 years, but maybe with the internet, we're just gonna jumble a bunch of styles in one <laughs> go. That's probably yeah. will be the case. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you are starting to see these 1970s, you know, decorative design details and even even fashion details, you know, sort of come back. Um, you know, we started to see that with 60s stuff about 10 years ago. It, you know, you can go into, um, you know, Target and find a basically a you know knockoff of a high end, you know, chair from the 1960s that, you know, the original model might be, you know, $500 chair, but it's only $60 at Target. Yeah. Uh, and so I think you're starting to see that the 70s pieces come in, you know, whether it's changed a little bit, but, you know, maybe the, the colors are more modern or something like that. But uh, we're definitely getting getting there for old guys like me. You know, so do people like younger people like you, you know, it's all new, right? <laughs> right. Well, I think that that's the part with 70s architecture that has the hardest part is that, um, you know, there are a lot of things that um, people really, really love about it. But then there are also a lot of things that people hate, like a lot of people don't like shag carpet. Or I was thinking about wood paneling. And I love that you mentioned that um, the dishwasher was no longer considered a luxury and how, because it wasn't considered a luxury, everyone wanted to hide it. Like that became the new thing is finding <laughs> different places that you could hide your dishwasher. And then like, oh, you push a panel and there it is. And all of those different right. you know, ways that that comes about and that difference between modernism, modernism um, and then, uh, try, you know, uh, what would that be? Homeliness, I don't know, comfort and what you do and don't want to have shown. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, preservation in general, right? You can't preserve everything out there. Um, so our job as preservationists is sort of, you know, to look for those, you know, to start out with those sort of landmark examples um, and, and get those recognized, get those documented, you know, raise the public profile celebrate the history of those and and maybe you know we'll start to filter down not only in the collective consciousness of uh, everyday architecture and preserving some of those examples as well um, but we need to kind of get there uh, and, and I would say we're not there because we're not even doing a good job preserving you know 50s and 60s architecture so let alone 1970s um, we got we got a long ways to go a, lot, a big catch-up game so hopefully 
we keep doing you know things like this just to get people a little bit more aware and uh, hopefully people will become a little bit more active out there and and speak up for buildings that they that they love uh out there because things are getting demolished every day without any yeah. sort of public outcry for sure yeah well and definitely if anyone has any 70s elements in your home that you were thinking of ripping out maybe think of some other options you know maybe you have seen a new um a new light and can it can find some joy and um and love and beauty in in some of these things that uh yeah you know you grew up in them so then there's this level of like uh i don't know if i want to bring that back but we're we, we you know definitely are finding a lot more of that coming about um what time are we at I'm wondering if there are any last questions that anyone wants to throw into the chat. And then, um, Stephen, if you have anything that you thought about, that, uh, I don't know, you have any questions for, or Michael, any last things? That you know, I guess just, I was curious, Michael, like your thoughts on, you know, it's so interesting to me, you know, the context that you provided and talking about all of the larger kind of political and cultural things that were going on during the 70s. And I'm curious what you think the perhaps the most prominent architectural elements, responses that may have come out of that. I think of the 60s and, you know, obviously the futurism and the, um, you know, new modern materials in the space age and all of this stuff coming out of World War II. And then it's interesting in the 70s that there's almost this kind of, you know, the, with the environmentalism and this embracing of nature in a way that seems kind of a response or reaction to that in some ways, but yet there's still these futuristic materials like you were showing with, you know, plastics and things like that. So it's almost a kind of one foot in the future, but then kind of moving back to the past. And I don't know, I, it's kind of a thought question. I'm just curious if what you kind of think is the most kind of unique thing about the seventies in that sense versus like the sixties and obviously the eighties are, we haven't gotten there yet, but you know, kind of what, what the responses of the cultural, political, everything of the seventies that we see in the architecture. Wow. That's a, that's a deep question. <laughs> Sorry to end on that here. I don't know. <laughs> you know, the, I, I think there's so many, there's so many, you know, that's the beauty of the 1970s is there's just this big, huge contrast between uh, even in today, right, of those higher end sort of architect design buildings and their visions of these architects to what everyday people are living in or working in or what builders are building uh, and, you know, how those things get watered down um, is where my interest sort of lies. So where, where are the high examples and then how do they uh, become sort of mainstream? Um, and I think, you know, I, I think of fun things, you know, architecturally, like, you know, sunken living rooms and, um, you know, where, where did it start and why didn't it catch on? Uh, you know, the, the conversation pit of the 1970s and 60s, you know, ends up sort of being the sunken living room of the 80s and 90s, right? Uh, in, a, in a bigger sense, not a small little area just for the couch, but the whole entire living room. So there's details like that that... Uh, you know, are sort of fun to explore. And, and I'm just cracking the surface myself, trying to get ahead of the curve um, before we have the you know, National Register nominations that come into play. And uh, I am not the expert by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I can uh, honestly say that, you know, I really appreciate everything you present today. Some of the deepest dive I've seen and uh, understanding some of the, you know, especially the split levels and, and you know, the, uh, the sunken earth and all of those, I mean, it's things that I'm familiar with, but again, just even as a professional and an advocate, I really am still myself learning to understand here. And so I definitely appreciate the research you've done. It's, it's one of the deepest dives and I think we've all learned a lot from that. So thank you again for sharing that. Absolutely. The discussion will continue, right? We all Definitely. have work to do. Somebody asked a question about which um, SOM building, Skidmore Homes in Merrill, and I hope you can see this on the screen here. This is the Bank of Washington building that was uh, the Skidmore Homes in Merrill project in Tacoma. So still there, uh, still looks pretty the same, has a super cool um, recessed um, plaza in the front of it so if you haven't gotten off the street and walked in down to that plaza check it out with the spiral staircase super 
super neat. Thank you. 1201 Pacific is the address, right? Right downtown. Great building. Uh, if you have more questions, you know, reach out to me. Um, Facebook me, tweet me, send me a note, you name it. You know, I'm obviously way up on the technology. Call me. I work better by email, but more than happy to uh, talk individually about uh, certainly 70s architecture or anything else that you might have interest out there. I'm, I'm here to help, and uh, I'll answer your questions if I can. Excellent. All right. With that, I think we're going to wrap it up. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Michael, for all of your very groovy, very cool information. Um, I now want to get more into that. I actually, I was very surprised how many buildings of those I knew. And I'm now going to see <laughs> as I drive around places. Um, Stephen, thank you so much for all of your uh, responses and um, knowledge. I also appreciated it as well. And yes, if you guys have any further questions, please email us. Um, and we are. this is part of our um, Broadening Horizons in Preservation Heritage Series. We will have a couple more lectures um, on preservation topics uh, as the year goes on. So please uh, look out for those. All righty, on that, I think we're gonna end it. Thank you guys again so much. Bye folks, bye-bye. Great, thank Bye, you. Have a good night.